Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much um, for joining us today. We would hereby like to um, start and open um, the public hearing on the draft ECB guidance to banks on leverage transactions. Um, we have uh, here on the panel um, Patrick Ami. He's the Deputy Director General of Microprudential Supervision One. And with him, um, four supervisors in his team, uh, Jean-Baptiste Thiel, Jan-Erik Volk, Ivan Stilianov, and uh, Georg Paula. Um, we would um, first, um, Patrick Ami will give a short um, presentation. Um, and afterward, you are very much invited to ask um, questions. When you ask a question, please um, state your name and your affiliation. And I would ask you, in the first round at least, to limit your questions to two, as the President does with his press conferences. Thank you very much. I hand over. Thank you very much, Jutta. Thank you very much. Welcome to all of you. Welcome in a, in a sunny Frankfurt. Um, uh, we are going to, to present a little bit of slides to, to introduce the, the, the topic. And of course, then thereafter, we are very happy to, to get questions and, and explain a little bit the rationale for the draft guidance. And I will share that presentation with colleagues um, just to make it a bit more lively. Uh, let's start with uh, maybe directly with slide three with the timeline of the public consultation just to, to uh, give a sense of timing and the next steps. So as you know, the public consultation was launched uh, end of November uh, last year. Um, uh, today is the public hearing and we will um, close the uh, consultation period at the end of last week. Um, we expect to receive a number of comments. We will analyze those comments and we uh, hope to be able to finalize the guidance by the end of the first half 2016. 2017, sorry. Um, on, the, um, uh, on the background and why we thought it important to uh, come up with a draft guidance on leverage finance. I think uh, just to remind, we uh, started in 2015 a thematic review on leverage finance. We sought, uh, based on uh, anecdotal evidence at that time, that the market was developing very, very fast with some trends that we wanted to investigate further. So we started that thematic review, uh, which was conducted in several phases. Uh, I think it's important to note that uh, already we issued to individual banks that were uh, is it better yeah that were subject to the uh, thematic review we issued individual recommendations with with specific timelines to address uh, specific uh, concerns or comments we had for each of those uh, banks subject to the thematic review. So the draft guidance is complementing uh, individual actions that are already being taken and being followed up uh, in GSTs. Um, uh, maybe just to concentrate on some of the main findings of uh, our survey and thematic review, we had um, a very marked increase in volumes and transactions since 2012. Um, with some features that uh, you all know of, uh, the trend towards covenant light transactions. And since we did the review, it did not, uh, this trend did not reverse, on the contrary. Um, and also, uh, a rather interesting features uh, in uh, 2014, um, the, the volumes of new transactions were uh, represented for more than a third of the new transactions with, um, with uh, a refinancing of existing transactions with higher leverage. Uh, so, uh, based on um, uh, those different trends that we noted uh, across the banks, uh, we had, as I mentioned, individual follow-up, and we thought it would be important to come up with uh, guidance um, to further steer uh, more uh, consistently the market, 
also having in mind that um, we are not the, uh, the first in doing this. We had uh, uh, prior uh, to our um, uh, interest in the subject, we had, as you know, uh, guidance being published in the US and so US banks are already subject to a guidance that is very similar in intent and content to uh, what we are trying to achieve here. Um, uh, I think it's important to mention that uh, what we want to uh, contribute to is uh, smooth and stable financing of the economy over time. This guidance is not about restricting access to credits to corporates. Uh, and I want to make that uh, very, very clear. Uh, maybe if we move to the next slide. Uh, uh, so, uh, just to remind that the guidance is expressing supervisory expectations. So, this means that it is a non-binding instrument, it is not a regulation per se. Um, however, uh, deviations from the content of the guidance will be, um, of course, uh, analyzed by the GSTs going forward and by the on-site inspections, and we will expect that banks explain material deviations from the guidance. Uh, the applicability of the guidance, it will be applied to uh, all institutions supervised by the ECB and however we, uh, of course, um, will uh, expect that banks uh, apply proportionality in applying this guidance and we will ourselves apply proportionality, meaning that banks that have very few activity in terms of leverage financing, of course, will not be uh, uh, expected to apply uh, the guidance in in uh, uh, the full level of detail. In terms of scope, um, we uh, want to apply it to a consistently defined uh, leverage transaction universe. Um, and uh, however, uh, some of the expectations in the guidance we feel might be relevant for other types of uh, uh, activities or operations like syndication activities, for instance, uh, more broadly. The guidance uh, itself addresses three key dimensions. As I mentioned, uh, a definition, consistent definition. The second is considerations pertaining to underwriting and syndication. And the third is uh, pertaining to risk monitoring and reporting and IT uh, tools. Um, the guidance, as I mentioned as well, is uh, closely aligned um, with the US guidance and, and other initiatives uh, and with the ECB draft guidance on non-performing exposures. We have some cases of deviation uh, from the US guidance that we will uh, present a little bit further in the slide, and I'm sure we will receive questions on those as well during um, this uh, public hearing. Um, maybe uh, I will give the floor uh, to, to Jean-Baptiste to uh, start presenting a little bit more in detail the definition part of the guidance. So good afternoon, uh, everyone. So um, thank you, Patrick. Uh, as you mentioned, we, we've run a thematic review on 2015, and one of the findings was pertaining to the to the definition of leverage transaction. And the finding we had is that uh, between banks, the definition uh, of a leverage transaction was very different. And sometimes also within banks, uh, they have some uh, multiple and often competing uh, definition of leverage transaction. That's why we come up with a, a proposal and a preliminary uh, definition of le leverage transaction that I'm going to uh, uh, go through uh, quickly in, in the slides. So um, uh, the definition works pretty simply. You've got elements of inclusions and elements of exclusion. And the first and main elements of inclusion is a leverage test where we uh, actually uh, look at the in-depth uh, in level of one borrower. And we assume that when uh, his debt is more than four times its operating profit, this corporate borrower is leveraged and should be captured by our definition. And this four-time metric is something that is uh, pretty common uh, as a market practice and also align with uh, the, ratio, the, the ratio that was uh, in the US guidance. When it comes to the bottom part of the slide, so the exclusion, so uh, we exclude, um, uh, we have three main exclusions. 
uh, from the scope of leverage transactions. So the one exclusion is related to uh, the counterparty type. So we don't want to capture loans to uh, private individuals. We don't want to capture a loan to public sector entities. Uh, the purpose of the guidance is not to have financial institution loan neither. Um, then we've got a second type of uh, exclusion that is uh, a kind of materiality threshold, so very small transaction, uh, small being defined as uh, below 5 million euro are excluded from uh, the scope of exposure that we want to capture. And finally, uh, we uh, exclude all the type of structured credit activities. Um, uh, meaning that what we want to focus uh, in the guidance is rather on cash flow based lending and we exclude uh, activities that are mostly asset based so asset based lending is excluded uh, commercial real estate is uh, is excluded um as you will see uh, on the right part of the slide we've got some uh, expectation in terms of what we want to see in the in the um, as a feedback from uh, from every int interested stakeholder in this public consultation. And what we are very keen on having is to have a kind of quantification of the exposure that would be captured by the guidance. So any type of quantitative information that you are able to provide us will be very helpful for us to size uh, more precisely, uh, even more, the effects of the definition. Um, and when it comes to exclusions, uh, uh, you might have some question of the comprehensiveness of these exclusions and uh, on that uh, particular point we also welcome uh, detailed comments on why sometimes you, you will deem some other exclusion uh, justified. So um, moving now to the, to the next slide, I will get a bit more in detail with uh, the leverage test. Um, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very basic ratio that compares the level of debt uh, with the, uh, the EBITDA. Uh, the EBITDA, as per the current version of the guidance, is based on an unadjusted uh, metric. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sure that we uh, will get more in details concerning this uh, unadjusted EBITDA, but something that is important to say at this stage is that uh, it doesn't mean that as part of the covenant negotiation that you have with the borrower, you cannot use an adjusted EBITDA. It just means that for the purpose of reporting and for a very basic consistency reason, we think at this stage that an unadjusted EBITDA will be the more uh, simple, uh, the simplest way to have consistency in the, in the bank that we are uh, monitoring. Uh, when it comes to the uh, second part of the ratio, the total debt, so we um, we wanted to make clear that we are um, uh, really speaking of total debt, so uh, we don't uh, uh, at this point in time net the cash of one borrower uh, for this calculation, in that we look at the at the commitment rather than only at the drawn part of the debt. So uh, whenever there is an uh, undrawn line, we uh, do expect at this stage that these undrawn, line, undrawn lines are uh, included in the, in the calculation. So I, I won't get into more deta details at this stage. Uh, feel free to, to ask questions after the, the presentation. And you will see again on the right side the type of information that we are keen on receiving. So you might have some IT constraints when receiving and using EBITDA, please let us know as part of the public consultation. And we have also one open question uh, on the treatment of uh, incremental debt uh, when it comes to the debt calculation. So uh, please feel free to give your thoughts uh, on that uh, and use uh, really this public consultation as a forum for discussion. So I give the floor to Ivan on, on, on the other aspect of the guidance. Yes, thanks a lot. Good afternoon from me too. Um, so on uh, top of the definitional aspects, the guidance also raises expectations with regard to risk management across uh, several points of attention which we identified as part of a thematic review. Um, so here, in any case, given the results of the review, we are confident that some of these aspects are already in place in some of the banks, but uh, we have not uh, seen the consistency which we would like to and we have not seen them as common practice and that's why we have uh, 
decided or we saw the need to outline them uh, a, bit, a bit more in detail in this guidance. Um, so here I would like also to use the chance to ask you um, to please flag as part of your comments uh, in the public consultation wh whether any of the outlined expectations would lead to material changes in the current internal approach to risk management. And uh, the, the more specific you are in your comments, uh, the better, obviously. Um, so now going through the expectations. Um, first and foremost, uh, we are in the view that, uh, that excessive leverage levels have proven to be risky and uh, raise supervisory concerns across most industries uh, over the cycle. So in this context, while we might not have necessarily seen um, evidence of excessive high leverage in the market right now, we would expect uh, banks to have detailed risk appetite uh, statements which outline acceptable um, leverage levels which would be in line with the overall risk appetite of the institution. So um, additionally, on, on the more quantitative side, the thematic review identified uh, a few cases of weak uh, underwriting quality, especially linked to covenant structures, which also find their way uh, in, in the industry more and more as we, as we have seen, but also linked to the assessment of syndication and also uh, refinancing risk. And then here we consider it appropriate to outline an expectation that uh, deals with um, the, the amount of leverage and the se essentially the expectation is that, uh, bank, uh, that banks consider financing uh, a borrower with uh, a leverage which exceeds six times debt to EBITDA only if this is approved and uh, reviewed by, by senior management as well. So here we have, uh, we have essentially um, received some questions around uh, this expectation, so maybe it makes sense to elaborate just a little bit further at this stage. Um, it must be clear here also, as uh, Patrick said in the beginning, that uh, we are not setting a non-pass threshold or, or any limit which says that deals uh, above six times should not be underwritten. Instead, we are setting an expectation for more stringent risk management and uh, deals with excessive leverage should essentially be uh, reviewed and approved by senior management of, uh, of the bank as well. And uh, lastly, this ex expectation applies to all forms of, uh, of syndication, which means uh, both to underwriting, but also to, to club deals. Um, I would give the floor to, to Jan to continue. Thanks, Ivan. Um, the next two items on page nine will tackle both qu aspects concerning uh, the failed syndications and secondly, uh, the repayment capacity expectations we are outlining in our guidance. So let's start with failed syndications. As uh, part of the thematic review, we uh, identified that uh, in adverse market conditions, the potential for banks to generate significant losses in underwritten exposures is existent and is a potential risk. Uh, at the same time, we've identified that the risk function should be actively involved in the syndication process, both in terms of monitoring and to limit and potential over-reliance of a uh, syndication function. Secondly, and uh, that's the third bullet you see on the left, uh, we raising expectations in terms of uh, senior management involvement in both the approval of a risk appetite and a strategy, but also in terms of, a, uh, of an overall monitoring framework underlying failed syndications. The whole thing translates, and that's what you see on the right, into two broad expectations, one being a more quantitative site, and the other part being more on a qualitative risk management side. In terms of failed syndications, the uh, current draft ACB guidance clearly outlines a, what we identified as part of the thematic review, a best practice in terms of the number of days past deal closure in which a transaction is to be classified as failed or hung. We've identified that as being 90 day, and that's the current threshold as stated in the guidance. That's also aligned with uh, the current threshold other supervisors have, and particularly the US, stated in their guidance. The second part, and that's the more qualitative risk management aspects of that, of that particular expectation, center around the involvement of senior management within the process, both in detailing a clear de-risking strategy and also detailing the procedures in place to manage distribution failures, which then again on the, on the right side links in with uh, the policies we expect to be in place in terms of the classification of exposures in the pipeline or in excess in terms of uh, classification to regulatory banking and the regulatory trading book. So in terms of key takeaways from that, the risk function as we speak uh, is expected to be more actively involved in the syndication monitoring of uh, underwriting. 
on the second part, and that's the bottom part you see on the repayment capacity. What we've identified as part of the thematic review has been, and as, uh, as, as previ previously highlighted, more liberal structures in terms of amortization profiles, which also, and that's uh, the second uh, point you see, have led to an implicit refinancing assumption in these structures. Um, the ability in these structures to service debt is, in most cases, given. Questioning the ability, however, of the borrower to ultimately repay the entire debt over a reasonable period of time. Uh, we aim at addressing both points in uh, our current draft of the ECB guidance. We call it repayment capacity, and we are expecting banks to have realistic assumptions both in their cash flow forecasts, but also in the uh, determining whether the borrower is able to, within a reasonable time, deleverage to a sustainable level. And that sustainable level, as per current draft, would be a deleveraging of 50% to 50% of total debt within a reasonable time frame defined as five to seven years. Again, aligning this supervisor expectations to those outlined within the US guidance. I'll pass the floor to uh, Georg to tackle the issues identified on page 10. Yes. So on page 10, um, uh, first on the credit approval process, um, the results of uh, a semantic review actually indicated um, an over-reliance on front office due diligence uh, as well as heterogeneous standards with respect to sensitivity analysis and stress testing. Uh, from this, uh, the guidance uh, first, of course, um, emphasizes the importance of strong involvement of the risk management in the credit approval process, uh, which of course should be clearly defined in the bank's policies. And in addition, uh, the guidance emphasizes the importance of sensitivity analysis and stress testing um, being uh, sufficiently conservative and capturing tail and market events as well as idiosyncratic events. Um, here at this point, uh, related to stress testing, we also uh, would highlight uh, that stress testing is not only uh, quite important uh, when we talk about the credit approval process, but especially also uh, when we talk about uh, the underwriting pipeline and also for ongoing monitoring, as you can see uh, in the lower part of the slide. Uh, expectations uh, in this respect would, for example, uh, comprise an in-depth review of assumptions made uh, during the due diligence from a macroeconomic as, again, idiosyncratic perspective, which should translate into severe but plausible stress scenarios and uh, which, of course, should result in a material um, impact on the portfolio. And finally, the last point we have here on the slide um, is uh, what we also would like to highlight, uh, the expectations uh, expressed on internal uh, impairment test triggers. It's important that when we talk here about uh, internal impairment test triggers, we are talking really about triggers triggering impairment tests and uh, these triggers are not related to the impairment test itself as criteria for uh, impairment when in the end within the impairment test. Um, these impairment test triggers are um, aligned with the EBA and ECB uh, NPL guidance and uh, the triggers uh, which uh, for example are outlined in the guidance are here um, yeah, breach, of course, of uh, material uh, financial covenant, uh, refinancing of a borrower at an increased leveraged, or the case uh, where the borrower's financial uh, situation um, is actually worse than initially projected in the stress case uh, during the due diligence. Um, this is the slide here, and now I guess I can pass on to Patrick. Thank you very much, Georg. Um, so uh, just to summarize, I think w what we're trying to achieve here is, is a consistent and proportionate uh, response to some of the features uh, exhibited in this market that we are concerned with uh, in a way that complements the, the bank by bank follow up that is being done uh, with uh, the teams at, at that moment and also consistent with uh, previous uh, examples, in particular the U.S. guidance. So with this, I'm very happy to open the floor and, and take questions. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, my name is uh, Sarah Schmidtke. I'm working for the European Banking Federation. And um, together with the national banking associations and the banks, uh, we've looked at this uh, guidance. So thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to participate here um, today. And I think there are, for, uh, there are two um, comments um, I'd like to, to make today, um, which both refer to the definition. Um, the first one would be on SMEs. Um, because of the very low commitment threshold of 5 million euros, um, we believe that uh, the guidance will include many SMEs, i.e. many clients of commercial and retail banking networks and not necessarily clients of the leveraged finance market. So, and because of the fact that um, many of the small companies may find it difficult to provide the data and the information, um, requested, um, we think they may find it more difficult to get bank finance. So um, I was just wondering why um, the ECB does not consider further conditions to exclude SMEs in particular via, let's say, a higher threshold um, or sales figures or a purpose test or something like that. And my second um, comment refers to um, level playing field. As the guidance only applies to significant institutions, it excludes uh, many players in the leveraged finance market, such as shadow banks, for example. So um, we see a risk here that unregulated players may grow as a result, which may actually lead to more systemic risk. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, on the on the first question, so which is the question of inclusion of SMEs, basically in the, in the scope of the guidance, and uh, I think basically uh, the answer would be would be twofold. Um, uh, we are sort um, uh, about uh, a full exclusion of SMEs per se from the scope of the guidance, uh, but we thought that. Uh, it's very much dependent on, on what you define as a SME, and we thought that it would be probably better to address this through a, a threshold exclusion. And I understand that your comment is that the threshold exclusion is, is too low and could even incorporate retail clients you mentioned. I, I, mean, I would be happy to be a retail client with uh, more than 5 million uh, financing, but um uh i suppose that indeed we we uh, we can uh, very much take uh, that comment on board and and reflect upon it uh, when finalizing the guidance and indeed i think uh this is uh, this is something we can think about we have been approaching banks on on an informal basis and best effort basis to try and size up uh, what will be the impact on on the current definition as proposed in the draft guidance uh, in uh, uh, on their books, based on their books, and so far we did not see uh, a lot of movement in what we received compared to what was already in force in the bank's own definitions. Uh, we have a little bit of movement, and this is uh, this is anticipated and desired. Uh, but uh, we have a number of cases where it doesn't move that much. That being said, this is uh, something we'll take on board for finalizing the guidance. Um, on the on the second aspect, on the level playing field, I think there is different uh, uh, elements to the to the question and to the answer. Uh, the guidance indeed formally applies to banks that are directly supervised by the ECB. Um, uh, it doesn't mean, of course, that uh, it will be without influence on banks that are in their indirect supervision uh, by the ECB, so the, the so-called less significant institutions in our jargon uh, that remain supervised uh, by the national competent authorities. Uh, as you know, we have also a role in trying to foster uh, consistent uh, uh, supervisory practices in that field, and we will, of course, incorporate, uh, as we do for uh, all documents that are published in by, the, by the SSM, we will, of course, uh, uh, strive to incorporate uh, the content of the finalized guidance on leverage finance into uh, the the role the realm of of uh, less significant institution supervision. Uh, that being said, I would expect in that field a lot of proportionality because obviously uh, most of uh, those institutions would not be uh, big players in the field of leverage finance. Uh, 
Um, the second aspect of your question is, of course, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, non-banks, and I think this is uh, something that we are confronted with in whatever we do as bank supervisors uh, when we talk about, uh, about financing and uh, financial markets. We have non-banks and uh, non-banking uh, non actors in those markets. That's a fact of life. We have to live with it. It doesn't mean that we are not preoccupied uh, with uh, what uh, uh, banks are doing, and this is what we want to influence primarily. Um, that's my, my first answer. The second answer, of course, is that um, we are not deprived from uh, ways of uh, signaling our concerns when we would have uh, broader concerns. We have a number of fora and publications for that, and we will, as we do for uh, the, the theme of the so-called shadow banking in general, we will, of course, not hesitate to signal trends uh, that we would find concerning for the non-banks as well. Uh, in future. Uh, the third aspect is uh, that we have noted that so far um, the non-bank actors are not so active in syndication and syndication is, is one of course big part of uh, the draft guidance and we believe that through uh, our uh, expectations on syndication practices we will have a broader influence on the market. And uh, finally, when uh, non-banks would take uh, significantly more risk than banks uh, in a particular market, uh, after all, maybe uh, this is not such a bad thing for the continuing and smooth financing of this segment uh, across the cycle. Other questions? Yes, thank you very much uh, also for your presentation. My name is Lena Stock, I'm from Fitch Ratings. I have a question on the definition of total debt. Would that include um, instruments which, are such as for example, vendor loan, shareholder loan, pick notes? Could you provide maybe more detail as how you define that? Thank you. So, so far, the, the definition of uh, uh, of total debt has, has been uh, very uh, taken from a high level perspective in, in the guidance. So, uh, we, we we speak about the, the debt in general without pre precising uh, exactly what type of structure we should uh, we should have uh, in. So, uh, I mean that's uh, that's um, a very interesting comment. Um, I'm not able to to get a lot of detail at this stage and give a, a preliminary answer or how we will treat specifically big notes or shareholders. So um, if you uh, can maybe give that question as part of the of the public consultation feelings and giving, for example, you as a, as a rating agency, how do you treat this, uh, this instrument as part of your debt calculation would be uh, very helpful. Um, so we know that we have certain challenges, for example, in terms of debt calculation, that could be the treatment of uh, uncapped uh, incremental debt. Uh, but uh, this question is, is also totally valid. So and, and we would be keen on receiving, especially from, from IT agencies that do that on an ongoing basis, your uh, current treatment. But so far, we have not strong view and deciding on exactly what, what, how we should be. And, and, and I think. Uh, we have need to refrain from being overly prescriptive on that field. Um, uh, we believe it's important that uh, we, we see a little bit the guidance developing and, how and see how it is implemented in practice before maybe refining from uh, with time uh, the, the field of application of the guidance when we will have uh, very specific questions of implementation or application. I think uh, that's probably the, the safe uh, way to go at this point in time. But th that being said, the question is, is very valid. Any other questions? There is, there's one here. Hi there, my name is Max Dansmann from Freshfields Brookhaus Deringer and um, what I haven't really understood so far when I read the guidance is um, how would you deal with um, typical acquisition finances in which um, 
there is a Bitco and a target group company that has the EBITDA DA, um, quite well and wouldn't cause the leverage threshold to be um, triggered and the Bitco doesn't have any leverage at all, would the whole group be subject to the guidance or do you have to make sure that the borrower that actually um, utilizes the loan has the EBITDA or can you just, because it is actually triggered on a consolidated basis or, or looked at in a consolidated basis, just use the loan or utilize the loan wherever it fits the best and you don't have to worry about EBTA thresholds and stuff like that. So currently, the, the, the I understand the question on the at which level do we calculate the the debt to a bit that trigger? Uh, at least that's one part of your of your question. And uh, the 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 stand that we have is that you calculate uh, the debt to a bit that ratio at the at the consolidated level of the bore. So for example, if you have a very wide group with uh, very different sub entities, and that each sub entities are asking different banks to finance, every one of them will have a, a debt to a bit that threshold. The one that we use is the one on the holding, the one on the consolidated, uh, uh, on the consolidated um, uh, parent. Then I also understand the second part of your question, which pertains to whether we, uh, uh, what happened in a situation where the borrower is leveraged, but the, the SPV used for the transaction is not. Is this a correct understanding? Uh, I think that, that the first time that we have the, the, the question, but ultimately I think it makes more sense to look at the borrower and the ultimate uh, counterparty that benefits from, from, from the loan. But so that's a preliminary answer, but I understand. It, ma it makes sense to, to actually look at the ultimate borrower. So, but, but in a syndicate loan with several obligors, you um, have a, a lot of uh, different entities, and would you look at each single loan, like if, if you have like, um, um, uh, in, uh, loan uh, loan amounts of altogether uh, 200 million, and there is um, one loan being uh, drawn of 4 million, for instance, by one borrower, and um, the rest of, of, of the entire loan would be um, utilized by others. Would that one loan, because it is below the 5 million threshold, not considered to be a leveraged loan? and all the others are, like how would that play together? Or would you say as long as there is one loan in, in, in the whole uh, um, financing, syndicate financing, the entire thing becomes a leveraged transaction? I, I, I will tackle this question a bit more globally so uh, and rephrase it in a way. Is it possible that one borrows as at the same time some leveraged transaction and not leveraged transactions? Uh, and this is possible. So let me give you a very uh, hypothetical example. But you have uh, um, um, a corporate that do oil and gas um, transaction, and that has two credit lines for financing its uh, its needs: one traditional corporate lines and one borrowing base. The borrowing base, because it's excluded from the uh, from the guidance, will not be taken. Uh, uh, will not be part of the exposure that we expect to be reported. It's secure by a specific collateral and so on. But the traditional corporate lines could be. So at the same time, it is from a theoretical perspective. We don't expect that to happen that often. But uh, having a leveraged transaction and a non-leveraged transaction as part of a more global leveraged borrowers. I, 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 um, I think that's it's a fair question, and we will uh, try to reflect that in the answer that we will uh, uh, give to the comments received on that part. Thank you. Uh, Sergio Lugaresi, Italian Banking Association. There is a third dimension uh, of the issue of level playing field, uh, which is uh, the level playing field in the U.S. market. Uh, you have mentioned the regulation uh, of the 
uh, US uh, authorities which inspires uh, this regulation, but there are some differences. I want to draw the attention to two, to one, and that, that is the, uh, the definition of EBITDA, uh, which is unadjusted in, uh, in the draft uh, guideline, whereas it is adjusted in the US, so I would like to ask why. And in the same vein, why the definition of debt uh, is gross, it does not exclude the, uh, the cash that can be uh, quite relevant, in, in particularly in, 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 in certain uh, companies. Yeah, so on uh, this is, uh, if we go back maybe to slide seven, uh, this is two of, of the, the points that we, we flag and we are particularly uh, interested on. Uh, receiving comments uh, as part of the uh, public consultation. On the unadjusted EBITDA, just to give a little bit of rationale of why we went for unadjusted, knowing that indeed the US guidance uh, allows for using the adjusted. Um, I think uh, the question we are having, and we are very interested in, in getting views on this, is how do we ensure consistent uh, treatment across banks and level playing field when we would use an uh, adjusted definition? Let me remind you that in the US, there is uh, something called the Share National Credit Process, where the US agencies put together a number of supervisors on a yearly basis and go uh, on the line-by-line -line analysis of uh, major transactions. And uh, in as part of that review, they are sometimes led to um, uh, make comments on the, the level of EBITDA as being reported to them by the banks, that is one, and on the level of credit quality, I understand, um, uh, on those transactions. And uh, we do not have, uh, at least for the time being, in the SSM such a mechanism we will uh, look at the enforcement of the guidance and the application of the guidance uh, through uh, regular on-site inspections, but by definition, these are bank-specific and will not ap apply always at the same time for all banks in, uh, that are being subject to uh, the guidance. And uh, the, the teams, the GSTs, will follow up uh, on, a, on a regular basis, but probably not to the level of detail, the going all the time on transaction by transaction basis. So uh, that led us to conclude that in the European context, it would be probably uh, uh, safer from the point of view of, of consistent treatment of banks, and maybe also from the point of view of simplicity of reporting, to use an adjusted EBITDA. Um, I would uh, also mention maybe um, uh, quickly that uh, uh, we would be keen uh, in understanding what is the general direction of adjustments. Um, uh, I would imagine that it tends to go uh, to lower EBITDA rather than higher EBITDA uh, on average, uh, which I can understand. But uh, so um, we thought that uh, all in all it would be more practical and, 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 and more consistent again uh, uh, in the way we deal with banks to go for unadjusted. Um, I want to make it clear again, um, the, the, the two metrics we use, the four times and six times EBITDA, are exactly equivalent to what is in the US guidance. So it's just the definition, of course, of adjusted and non-adjusted. And the sixth time uh, is not does not mean prohibition. Hmm? It's uh, it's I important to note. We just want to make sure that senior management and the highest level of, of credit analysis in banks is aware of the risks that are being taken in that field, and are making sure that this is consistent with risk appetite, as set by the governance of the banks. This is what we want to make sure of. So. Um, we, we thought that it would not be uh, such uh, uh, an issue. Uh, we have, uh, since the launch of the public consultation, we came to understanding that it was a little bit of a, of a pressure point, so we are happy to receive 
comments and suggestions in that respect. Again, it would be uh, very much appreciated to understand in which way uh, you going for uh, an adjusted EBITDA would ensure consistent treatment of banks. Uh, that's that's something that, as you know, is important to us. We uh, nevertheless understand that that may cause some uh, some uh, uh, reporting difficulties if banks would have to report the same transaction uh, to the U.S. on an adjusted basis, and uh, and to us uh, on uh, on an uh, unadjusted basis. So that's um, something we are we are happy to to discuss and and dig further in. Um, but again, to explain you the rationale, and we will, we are happy to receive reasoned comments in that in that respect. Um, the second one is the 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 total debt definition and the netting with cash. Our understanding is that the U.S. definition is is uh, using a, a, a non-netted uh, uh, metric. Uh, but we are happy to be uh, to be contradicted on this, and if uh, we receive a specific comments in that respect, uh, we will uh, we will uh, look at them. Uh, I would just point to the fact that um, uh, calculated at inception, calculating at inception, uh, uh, an EBITDA metric net of cash might be uh, slightly uh, optimistic or misleading uh, in times of crisis, of course, because the cash may have uh, vanished at that time. So maybe it makes more sense to calculate uh, growth of, uh, of cash. Hello, Pascal Ernst from uh, Unicredit Group. Um, so uh, my question would be, is the overarching aim of this guidance to identify and to monitor a high risk portfolio? And uh, if so, should investment grade companies be excluded because per definition and by uh, on the basis of other criteria, they are low risk? So I understand your question on whether we could have on, on top of the definition a kind of rating trigger that would say uh, investment grade are, uh, are out of the scope of leverage transaction and uh, yeah. non-investment grade would still be part of a leverage transaction. I mean, exactly because for example, we have uh, very often we have utilities uh, uh, which is very, very stable. Uh, our regulation is very, very stable. And uh, they they always have an, a leverage of, of four times or above. So it's uh, and they are investment grade companies. And there are of course other factors wi which can be taken into consideration rather than only leverage. Okay. So so, so uh, I will treat the, the the question uh, of u utilities in the in the second part of my question. But we we made the choice at the beginning to uh, not rely on uh, on uh, rating trigger because it's also. Uh, what it's, it's also consistent with what the U.S. Uh, does actually in their guidance, and not relying on uh, on a rating trigger to define what it's in, what it's out. Um, that being said, we would expect some kind of alignment between, in most of the case, between the rating and the fact that the borrower is indebted more than four times. So, meaning that we would expect that the major share of what we capture is actually non-investment grade. And when it comes to, to specific example of, um, of uh, you mentioned utilities, but uh, it could be other stuff, of exposure that deserve exclusion because, uh, because uh, their rating or the collateral that they have have, um, have, a, have a better quality, we would be keen on receiving exactly a, a detailed reasoning on why uh, this should be excluded. Is this something different in terms of risk? Is this something? Um, I, I'm sure that uh, the rating agencies use some some criteria to make them investment grade, despite of their high leverage. So um, 
um, we we happy to 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 understand on on, on a very very granular details type of activity that you deem needs to be excluded. But so far, uh, that we we didn't use a rating trigger, and also uh, as part of our objective to be consistent with the U.S. Yeah, may maybe just yeah uh, to 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 reinforce that point. I think um, this is typically uh, a case where we could have in introduced a rating trigger. Uh, but we, we sought to be consistent with the U.S. definition precisely for uh, uh, in, in uh, liaison with the, the previous question. So um, this is something we, we could consider. Um, again, I, we're not sure it would be a big mover in terms of uh, what would be captured as part of the definition or not, uh, probably uh, with the exception of utilities. And uh, we are happy again to receive detailed reasoning or on, 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 on which ground we could exclude utilities, uh, maybe because the, the cash flow profile is dependent on, on long term contracts uh, that have some sort of security, just hinting at a possible exclusion uh, mechanism. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, comments welcome on that part. very much. Hi, my name is Niklas Leibecker. I come from uh, Alvarez and Nassau. Um, <coughs> in your presentation, you mentioned um, that all the transactions that exceed the six, um, six times that threshold um, should involve separate or specific senior management involvement. And um, in the draft guidance, you said that um, those, transa th those transactions should be exceptional and specifically justified. Um, now, my question would be, do you have a specific expectation or some kind of a catalog that you would like to see as um, justifications for those exceptions, or is this something that should develop over time? Uh, no, we, we, we don't have an ex ante uh, catalog of, of expectations or, or uh, the kind of, of box ticking template that you should fill in on, on a transaction by transaction basis. We believe that it's best left to the way banks organize their risk management. Uh, and uh, again, uh, what we want to achieve with this is making sure that there is uh, a, a clear understanding of the type or and, and, uh, and quantum of risk being taken in those specific transactions because we believe that they go into a territory that is uh, uh, much riskier than, uh, than uh, other tradi more traditional, let's call them that uh, transactions and that it is important that there is full awareness at the highest level of, of credit approval in the banks. How this is done and and uh, how this is implemented, we, we think it better to leave it uh, to the banks for the time being. And of course, over time, we may see practices developing that we will consider to be best practices and we may complement all over time. But uh, I think for the time being, it would not be completely reasonable to go with very uh, deep prescriptions on, on that respect. Uh, of course, depending on the volumes associated that, uh, uh, that might, um, and depending on the uh, existing organization of banks, that might uh, involve a number of steps. And we believe it's, it's, uh, it should be fully embedded into the risk management structure of the banks rather than something a bit artificial uh, that is being done just for the supervisor. That's uh, far from being the objective. Hi, Alessandro Calaccio, Goldman Sachs. Um, two questions on something you mentioned earlier. I understand that the six times leverage th threshold is not intended to be a bright line for prohibiting transactions. What about the cash flow test? I mean, there's an expectation of minimum cash flow um, projections. And second question is, how do you think about how do you think about borrowers who find themselves today in a situation where they have too much debt relative to their ca projected cash flows? And how do you think about allowing these borrower access to credit for refinancing or for maturity extension. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, it's a very interesting question. So the, the, the cash flow test, we don't see it as a bright line either. Uh, we see it as uh, a trigger for uh, considering whether there is a need to uh, consider that uh, a transaction should be impaired and should be considered as being in default. But uh, I'm not sure that that could be regarded as a bright line, so as a, a kind of automatic uh, uh, recognition, default recognition, or automatic impairment trigger. Uh, we are uh, fully aware, of course, that there are other uh, factors to consider. Uh, it is uh, uh, like uh, projection of future cash flows. What are the trends in the business model of uh, of uh, the corporate, and and uh, what are the the trends in the economic environment, etc. So there are probably a number of of other elements to to uh, take into account. That being said, of course, that when uh, we will have our on-site teams going to the banks. I would expect that this is one of the first things uh, they ask for when they would look at leverage finance. Uh, and they will probably uh, just ask for uh, the, the number of uh, transactions uh, being in that category and look at uh, how banks have uh, assessed uh, the need for a default recognition or, or impairment. Um, but uh, again, uh, this will not be a, a bright line. Hello, my name is uh, Julian Tsai from Linklaters. Um, <coughs> are the guidelines supposed to only capture loans or also other debt instruments? Uh, I think at some uh, place within the guidelines you mention bonds as well. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, the answer is quite simple, that's loans only. Uh, we're not capturing high bonds or derivative as part of the scope that um, used for defining what is in or what is out of the of the guidance. So it's loans. It could be uh, warehouse loans, for example, but that's only loans. Uh, at some point, we do mention IE bonds, and it comes with uh, with the fact that uh, we say that the guidance is is valid for loans, but some ex expectation could be useful for other uh, type of um, type of instruments. So, for example, what we say on, on syndication and uh, in terms of due diligence could be true for, for bonds as well. So the bonds are not uh, mean to be captured as part of the, of the transaction. Most of the uh, tr expectation applies only to loans um, and, and therefore should not be reported in, uh, in as part of the exposure ca captured. Not, not either. Not either. Uh, maybe one, one, one point to to complement. Um, uh, we are of course aware that there might be over time substitution effects. So we will uh, because because we understand that loans tend to exhibit more and more some of the the characteristics of bonds, and so. Uh, uh, w this is something we will uh, be uh, interested in monitoring going further. So we will also look at bond issuances and investments by by banks and uh, warehousing pipelines, etc. And and uh, see how uh, both markets are developing over time. If there are no more questions, um, we'd like to thank you very much for your interest, for asking a lot of questions, and um, wish you a nice weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, again, we are um, uh, hoping that uh, we get um, contributions that will uh, help us in finalizing the, uh, the guidance. Thank you.